He's one of the most influential game designers of our time. He practically invented the god game genre. But almost missed his destiny. I've got into the industry almost on a dare, almost on a bet. One of the greatest games almost didn't hit the shelves. And I actually stopped working on it, put it aside for about six months and worked on a different game. He's a mastermind. Civilization is just a monumental, a Hall of Fame game, if there was a Hall of Fame. Who questioned himself. I really faced a, a dilemma after Civilization was out there. Was, uh, was I going to try and top Civilization and then try and top that game and try and top the game after that? He overcame his doubts. Sid Meier is just an outstanding personality. He's a philosopher, he's an educator. I learned quite a bit from him. He is the most humble person I know. And is extremely brilliant. I concur, Your Excellency and conquered an industry. You know if the Sid Meier name is on it, then it's gonna be a good game. This is the story of the men behind the God Games, Sid Meier. As a child, Sid Meier is both imaginative and motivated. I was always interested in, in games and kind of letting my imagination run free and playing, you know, learning about railroads, and playing with toy soldiers or blocks or whatever. So I think my childhood set me up in a lot of ways to be a computer game designer. And he finds inspiration in his grandparents' backyard. I spent a summer living with my grandparents, and there's a train that ran right by their house, so I clock went five or six times a day. And I could walk to the train station and see the trains come in, and check the schedules, and it fascinated me the way that the trains were poised right on time. Getting closer to the industry he will eventually dominate, he goes on to study computers. In those days, computers took up an entire room, and uh, they couldn't play games on them. They were only for uh, serious uh, things. But I studied programming and system design, so I got a pretty normal job uh, installing computer systems in department stores. Then all of a sudden, a personal computer came around, and I said, hey, this is what I want to be doing, writing computer games. So I, I got a personal computer, and in my spare time, I started making games. He not only makes one, he sells one. The very first game that, that I sold, I programmed the game, I printed out the manual on my home printer, I put it in a bag, in a plastic bag that I bought at the Giant, and took it down to the computer store and said, hey, do you want to buy this computer game? Their answer is yes, and Sid falls in love. In the early days, it was very much a labor of love. I enjoy games and I like computers, and kind of just putting those two together and watching what appeared on the screen, and it was really a feeling of creativity. In my day job, I couldn't be very creative, but at night I could create these fantastic games at home. So it was really uh, a labor of love at first, and then it gradually over time it turned into an industry. And a simple win leads Sid into the hands of the gaming industry. I got into the industry almost on a, on a dare, almost on a bet. Uh, a friend of mine and I were, were playing a computer game, and, and I beat him, and, and he said, you know, how, how could you do that? You know, I'm a, I'm a great computer game player. And I said, well, you know, I, I'm a programmer, so I can kind of understand the design of the game. And he said, well, you know, if you're so good, uh, you'll write a game. I said, well, I, okay, I could do that. And he said, well, then I'll sell it. That friend, Bill Steely, is a former Air Force major with great technical expertise. Combine that with Sid's creativity, and you have a new endeavor. We actually got together and started a company called Microprose way back in the early days of computer games. Their first game is Hellcat Ace, a flight simulator. It's released in 1984. The early days of Microprose were very much a time of discovery and exploration. We tried to make games that appealed a little more of an adult audience, a little more serious games. F-15 Strike Eagle was the first realistic modern combat airplane game. We basically created games that we liked to play. If a game hadn't been written yet and we wanted to play it, we had to go out and write it, and that's what we did. And my having ground, x one ready to check, uh, taxi to one, two. Microprose quickly establishes a name for themselves as a provider of flight and air traffic control simulations. By 1987, he takes a chance on a whole new concept. My partner, Bill, wanted me to do another flight simulator, because we had just done F-15 and been successful, and said, you know, do another flight simulator. And I said, you know, I don't want to do the same game all the time. I think I'll do a game about pirates. And he said, no, no, nobody will buy that. I said, well, I want to do a game about pirates. And he said, 
So maybe if we put your name on it, then the people who like F-15 will buy pirates. Sid Meier's Pirates is an adventure role-playing game in real time. It's released on the Commodore 64. One thing that he did do that I think is pretty seminal was combine different genres of games uh, into a single title. With Pirates, for example, he took role-playing, action, and adventure, commerce, and all these different elements that used to be separated into their own different game genres and brought them all together in one experience. Pirates, people are still playing. It's kind of an open-ended role-playing game where you get to be a pirate and sail the Spanish main and capture ship. It's almost like starring in a movie. One of my friends introduced me to a game called Pirates on the Commodore 64. I thought it was an incredible game. It wasn't so much that I wanted to make that game myself, it was the fact that I wanted to work for a company that made products like that. I said, this is what the future of gaming is going to be. Microprose goes on to create more military strategy type games. And in 1988, they released the video game version of Tom Clancy's novel, Red Storm Rising. But the success of these games is nothing compared to what Sid is about to do. By 1987, Sid Meier creates his own company, Microprose, that reaches sales of more than $20 million. Most of his games are military-based, and most of his ideas are great. I really didn't know what to expect when I started writing computer games, but I did it because I enjoyed it. But I remember a point when uh, we had one or two games that were successful, and I suddenly realized I could do this for a while, you know, this could be like a real job. He begins to capitalize on his name, and in 1990, releases Sid Meier's Covert Action. Absolutely, it's an effective marketing tool. Not only is it telling you that it's a Sid Meier game, but it's also telling you that it's a game of quality. You, know, you, you realize what you're going to get from a Sid Meier game, and so it's absolutely a right decision. I, I don't think it speaks to egotism at all. Sid goes back to his roots for inspiration on his next game, which combines competition, colorful characters, and financiers of the railroad business. The result is Railroad Tycoon. Railroad Tycoon was kind of the first game that we did that, that was basically about creating something as opposed to destroying something. The game puts you in the railroad business, laying track, managing corporate finances, and even setting schedules. You've got game mechanics that people want to buy into and make it fun to actually put the pieces down you'll have a success. While testing Railroad Tycoon, he meets fellow designer and fan, Bruce Shelley. He was just a, a joy to work with. He was almost like my twin brother in a lot of ways. He gave me a lot of support, a lot of ideas. Uh, first of all, it was an incredible fun. It seems like part of the mission statement for game development should be, let's have fun doing this. And we did have fun together. Beyond that, I mean, I, working with him was like going, I've described that as going to Game Design University. He prototypes by himself. He does his own art, does his own programming. If you read the credits of the game, they say, by Sid Meier with Bruce Shell. I, I just thought that that was my role. You know, he was a star. In September 1991, Microprose goes public and raises an estimated $18 million. Sid, always being the creative person, grows disenchanted with the business side of things. I realized that I couldn't be responsibly looking after the business side of Microprose, doing what I needed to do there, and be a, uh, a game designer. So I made the choice that I'd really rather be a game designer, sold my share in Microprose, and just became an employee there, essentially. After that, I did Civilization, so it must, must have been the right decision. The development of Civilization is influenced by another gaming guru, Will Wright. Civilization went through a pretty strange path to get to where, where it ended up. It first started off as a, as a real-time game, much like SimCity. Frustrated with the results, Sid Meier walks away from his pet project. And I actually stopped working on it, put it aside for about six months and worked on a different game. After his self-imposed hiatus, Sid goes back to the drawing board, decides to take the game in a different direction, and adds historical elements. By 1991, Sid Meier's Civilization is ready for shipment. For the first half, we, we really weren't sure about Civilization, but there came a point where it just clicked. And we couldn't stop playing. And then we realized that this game is, is something special. Although inspired by SimCity, Civilization is very different. It's a strategy game, 
and the player is given 6,000 years to turn a wandering tribe into a technologically developed society. I think Civilization was kind of the culmination of a lot of the threads of games that I've been working on up to that time. It's really the, a, a game that included the idea of building as opposed to destroying. And it included lots of elements of history, which was always something that I was interested in. You get to be an emperor, a king, and even a president. And the power you hold means getting to decide the fate of a nation. Civilization, in a nutshell, is really the history of the world brought to life on your computer. You get to direct it and control it. You know, you can play a game of Civilization and go tell somebody about it. You know, say, oh, you know, well, I was having this really horrible time with the Egyptians there on my continent and they're just trying to take over. You know, you begin to get caught up in the cinematic feel of everything. I think that really, really sets them apart. Civilization is different from previous strategy games because it's not based on war. Civilization incorporates military conflict as, as part of the strategic uh, situation that you're dealing with, but it covers economics, politics. So all those elements really get stirred in together to make Civilization an uh, interesting game to play. I think he's truly curious about everything and he looks in different places for things. Following its release, Civilization hits a nerve with audiences and becomes an instant success. It was just the topic was so familiar to people, the way it flowed along from one event to the other. It was kind of engrossing and drew people in. And somehow it just struck a chord for its time and became a really popular game. I think a lot of it's being at the right place at the right time and, and finding the right market for your games. Fans simply can't get enough. We hear from a lot of people who play Civilization, and quite a few of them say, you know, my, my girlfriend hates you, my wife hates you, because, uh, you know, I won't stop playing this game and I won't pay any attention to them. They appeal to, you know, again, an, an intelligent people, strategy-minded people, adults mainly. I mean, these are uh, classic games. They go way back. They're very deep, intricate gameplay. Uh, they, they can consume your life almost as much as EverQuest. Somehow we capture that addictive quality in civilization, and it, it's it, a lot of it is magic. We don't really know exactly how we did it, but we're just happy that we did. But I have one story that kind of counteracts all, all of those comments. And a young boy shares his very personal experience. We got a letter from, it seemed, it seemed like maybe a 10 or 12 year old boy, uh, it said, you know, civil, I like civilization. Uh, your game saved my family because uh, one night, late at night, my mother was in the basement playing civilization couldn't go to sleep, she smelled smoke, there was a fire in the house, she woke everybody up, got them out of the house, and saved the whole family. So civilization saved that family. So I think that counteracts all the unhappy wives and girlfriends out there. Sid Meier looks at things from a gamer's perspective. He plays a lot of games, which I think also sets him apart. Uh, he approaches games as a gamer because he spends a lot of time, you know, with his hands on them. He's not just interested in it from a conceptual standpoint or from a design standpoint. He's interested in it from the standpoint of the gamer. What's their experience going to be like? I think he spends a lot more time playing games than most other designers do. With the unprecedented success of Railroad Tycoon and now Civilization, Sid Meier helps give breath to these so-called God games. I suppose that's probably the best uh, description. You are omnipotent in that world. You build the railroad. You build it from the ground up, or in civilization, you build it from the ground up. He practically invented the god game genre. The 4X genre with, with titles like Railroad Tycoon, Civilization. Games that really sort of let you get in and manage a whole system. They're not focused on one particular aspect of it, like military or commerce or whatever, but they combine them all into one experience. I think Civilization uh, was the biggest surprise to us. We, we loved little Civilization as he was growing up, but when we sent him out into the world, uh, he really surprised us. He, he was a, just a, a star out there. But can he come up with another star? Sid Meier begins to question himself. I really faced a, a dilemma after Civilization was out there. Was, uh, was I going to try and top Civilization and then try and top that game and try and top the game after that? Sid Meier is the mastermind behind both Railroad Tycoon and Civilization. His name alone earns him respect, and he's helped give life to a brand new genre, God Games. How can he keep up the pace? It was a, a real concern to me that I, if I kept trying to top myself each time, I'd eventually go crazy. I didn't want to go uh, 
not down that road. So he opts to change directions, and in 1993, Sid releases CPU Buy, a music composition game. What I did almost for my own mental sanity was kind of take a completely different path and do a, a product called CPU Buy. But can he really stay away? The answer is, of course not. Sid eventually comes full circle, and in 1994, Colonization is released, followed by the successful Civilization II in 1996. But in May 1996, things turn for Sid as he makes the decision to leave Microprose, taking designers Jeff Briggs and Brian Reynolds with him. They form a brand new company and call it Firaxis Games. Firaxis was formed kind of as a reaction to the, the growth of Microprose. We decided to start a small company, which was only concerned with developing uh, computer software, but the emphasis was on creativity and making good games as opposed to trying to run a, a large business. Their first release is in 1997. It's called Gettysburg and is a groundbreaking real-time war game. Following closely behind are Alpha Centauri, Antietam, and Civilization Three. They've all been well received critically. We've got a lot of good feedback from our fans, so we think we made the right decision. And most of all, we enjoy working every day, and that, that's really the most important thing to us. And in February 2002, they let their creativity loose with Sim Golf. Huh? Sim Golf was a, a project that kind of started as a game about designing a golf course and grew and grew into a game about people and the way they interact and the comedy of what happens on a golf course. Uh, oh, shock. Creating your own characters and holding tournaments. <laughs> it's more than a game about golf, it's almost a game about life. My Shuno! <laughs> the bottom line is, it's huh. still a game. And to Sid Meier, being a gamer is what he loves most. I think one of the secrets to our success is that we play our games over and over again as a ring development. So when you play games in practice, that game's been played to death by us. <laughs> and with genes like Sid's, it's no surprise that a certain someone is following in his footsteps. My son is a crazy computer console gamer, and he really uh, inspires me a lot these days. He really inspires me to include the younger demographics to make games easy to play, to make them maybe a little more exciting. The Civilization franchise has earned millions to date, and Sid Meier has earned his place among the elite. When we picked Game Gods a few years ago, probably the first name on the list was Sid Meier. He is probably the ultimate certifiable Game God. I mean, his resume is amazing. Uh, and Civilization is just a monumental, a Hall of Fame game, if there was a Hall of Fame. And what can we expect from Sid and Firaxis now? Will civilization come to an end? Uh, we certainly hope not. <laughs> we haven't run out of ideas for civilization, so I think it'll be around for quite a while. We're happy making computer games, making strategy games, making kind of new games that people haven't seen before. Sid Meier entered the gaming industry as a gamer, and that's exactly where he remains. He conquered the unbelievable and created the unreal. He is a mind to look out for and a human being to look up to. And a lot of the things that he's done right have been emulated over the past 10 or 15 years. He's always one to surprise you, so we'll have to wait and see. Well, he is the most humble person I know. He's the most generous person I know. And the most ingenious person I know. <laughs> ah! He's got an amazing breadth of talent. From his very first game, the F-15 flight simulator, to Pirates, which is an RPG adventure, to Civilization, which is an empire builder. He's had his hand in a lot of different types of projects. Let us build marketplaces so that the peasants can barter for needed goods. They will find new surprises. He's, he's always going in new directions. He has never done the same game a second time. He's become an icon, I mean, he's become a brand unto himself, um, but it doesn't seem as if any of that has gone to his head. Oh yeah, uh-huh. I hope to see a lot of games from Sid Meier in the future. Every single game that he does is a big deal. General, we've been skirmishing all morning. They can't hold out much longer. 
Where's that infantry? Look there. Coming up the Emmitsburg Road. That's the 1st Division. The Black Hat Boys. Thank God. So he's not just a designer and an innovator. He was also the entrepreneur, started a couple important companies. And he's a philosopher, he's an educator. I learned quite a bit from him. I think what has made Sid Meier such an inspiration to game designers is that he figured out a way to take the economies of the real world, you know, civilization, and actually turn that into something that we can toy with. And uh, for that, there's so many of us that will be forever grateful. It really doesn't feel like I've been designing games for 20 years. That's an incredible amount of time. But looking back, there is a little bit of a sense of pride that, that we were there at the beginning, we, we saw the history of the industry, we were part of it, and I'm really glad to have been there, you know, in, in the, the good old days, the formative days. Wow, I, I enjoy this. Life is good, you know, I to do what I like. I think we have a kind of a unique game development style in that if we find something we like, we build on it. We buy people.